Well, good morning. Welcome to our service. We're grateful you're here. Last week I was gone, but the uh, platform was all decked out for Vacation Bible School, and this week I'm back and we have it all decked out for uh, our band camp week. And so this is an unusual setup for us, but it's uh, going to be a wonderful week. We are looking forward to it each year. This is our sixth band camp, band and choral camp, that we've been able to host and, and hold here just to be a, um, a, a, a wonderful time to infuse energy and instruction to our instrumentalists in our school and in the community as well as our church uh, folks here. And so we are looking forward to it. And as we have made some announcements of uh, that, that that was coming up this week, here it is. And we have a couple of guests that are with us. We have Dr. Paul Overly. You'll hear from him on the trombone a little bit later, and, uh, and then we have uh, Miss Kaylee Shaleen, who is, uh, her dad is the one who started a lot of these band camps that I had been a part of, and so she's very familiar with it. She's freshly graduated from Bob Jones University, and she'll be playing on the oboe here a couple different times this morning. So we're looking forward to worshiping together uh, and enjoying some extra special music uh, that, as it goes on this morning. Um, Pastor Berlin wants me to make sure I communicate to you his regards. Um, he, at this point last uh, week, was planning to be here this week to preach, and, um, but, uh, and then leaving tomorrow morning to go to a family camp in Canada that he is, uh, being this, that he is a speaker for. Um, but due to some uh, communication things, and some, uh, he discovered Friday that he was actually supposed to be there on Sunday. Or at least that's what they were counting on. And uh, so uh, he is there preaching in uh, a couple hours away over there. He'll be there all day. So we want to uh, pray for him and uh, Michelle as they are over there. Pray for our band camp ministry as it goes on, the children's choral camp. Thank you to so many of you who uh, contributed and helped to make the way for some who were not able to uh, cover their own way uh, to come. What a blessing, what a giving spirit you have demonstrated to them, and I know that this week will be a blessing uh, to them as well. Um, but let's go ahead and get started this, this morning. We'll go have a word of prayer. When I'm, oh, actually, we need to have our guests, don't we? Let's, I'm going to get uh, things out of order a little bit. Let's ask our ushers to come. And if you are here visiting with us for the first time, or as we like to say, the first time in a long time, uh, it's been a while, and we would love to get a record of your attendance and uh, give you a pen that is a gift for, yours to keep, for, for you to keep and um, look through some information we'd like to, for you to see about our church, maybe answer some questions that you might have. But just slip your hand up as the ushers come by, and if you'd like to have one of those, they would love to uh, hand that to you. If you can turn in the, the sheet there, fill out a, the form there, uh, just with your name and uh, your contact information that we, if you would like for us to get in contact with you, any prayer requests you might have that we might be able to pray for you, and then if we, we would like to have Pastor come by and visit or one of the staff to come by and visit, answer some more questions, we would like uh, you to indicate that on there as well, and we would like to follow up with you. Again, we are grateful that you are here. We're looking forward to a wonderful morning. We're thankful for Pastor Brandenburg, who is able to just step right in and uh, preach this morning, this evening as well. I know that your hearts will be challenged uh, from the Word of God as he preaches this morning and this evening. So let's um, have a word of prayer together. When I'm done, we'll have a time of silent prayer where you can just ask the Lord to prepare your heart individually, and, um, and then we'll get started with our song service. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, Thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity we have to gather as a church, to come together, to assemble and uh, get to know one another better, get to be able to fellowship with one another, um, that we would be able to lift up your name in our hearts and in our voices through song, um, that we would be able to focus upon you and that as a church we would rally around the truths of your word and about the truths of your character that we will exalt today. I pray that you would help us not to just go through motions uh, here, that we wouldn't just come, uh, sit down, stand up, sing, and, and uh, listen and leave, but that we would uh, eagerly anticipate that you want to do a work in our hearts. And I pray that your word would be made alive in our hearts, that it would be unmistakable what it is you want us to do with the truths that we see in your word, and that we would humbly and obediently respond to them in the way that we ought to, that we would leave here as uh, changed, as encouraged, um, as emboldened in our walk with you. Lord, if there's someone here that does not know you as their Savior, I pray that you would help them, and that you would open the eyes of their understanding, their hearts, that they would...
song that we're going to sing is in our hymnal, but uh, there's an extra verse that we're going to be singing that is not in our hymnal, and we're going to change the tune. So just take a look at the screens and follow these familiar words as you stand together and sing, I will sing the wondrous story. We will be singing it to the tune of Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Let's sing it out together. I will sing the wondrous story. I will sing the wondrous story.
as we said, we have a, an opportunity to hear from a few of our some extra instrumental music here. So Dr. Overly has uh, been here for all of our band camp um, years, and uh, so we're glad, grateful for, to have him back. Um, some of you remember Mark Frederick, who had been coming to all of these as well, and uh, he was the French horn player. He's unable to come this year, and that's why we actually have uh, Kaylee coming and filling in for him, um, but, uh, but she just plays the oboe. Well, she plays a lot of things, but she doesn't play the French horn like uh, she plays the oboe, and uh, so we're grateful for her ministry to us that way. And um, one of the things I like about uh, uh, Dr. Overly is that he um, helped my son get a little bit more excited about playing the trombone, and, uh, it, and each of these teachers have loved to pour their lives into the next generation, and so it's a grateful heart that I can have them all sing or play together this duet. Choir to come and get in place. Of, of, of lines of demarcation are placed throughout that book. And uh, if this is true in your life, then this can't be true. And only if this is true can this other thing be true. And as I, lo I love reading that book, and this is one of the truths that comes from that. And just as a reminder that God loved us first and so that we can love Him in return. But not only that, we can uh, show God to others, we can make him manifest as we love one another. No one has seen God at any time, but as people see that we love one another, they can see that aspect of who God is. God is love.
with the one who set me free. As I lift my eyes and see his awesome glory, I remember who he is and bow the knee. Bow the knee, bow the knee. He is king of all the ages, bow the knee. God alone on his throne. See him high and lift it up and bow the knee. Kneel before him, all adore him. As you live to love him more, bow the knee. In his hand he holds the power of creation. With his voice he spoke and all things came to be. Yet he hears each simple prayer I bring before him. As I humbly seek his face and bow the knee. Bow the knee. Bow the knee, he is king of all the ages, bow the knee, God alone on his throne, see him high and lift it up and bow the knee. Ushers are coming at this time uh, for the time of collecting our tithes and offerings. And um, we, again, as we always want to remind you that uh, this is not a requirement that God has placed upon us so that we can earn favor with Him. Um, God does not need any money, uh, but He has asked us to support the ministry of the local church and to give uh, to Him through this, the ministry here. And uh, so that the uh, Lord can take that, it, even a little bit as it might be, and bless it for His ministry, for His glory, both here, in the, here at this church, but also abroad as we give to our missions and um, to the uh, ministries that go outside of this building as well. Thank you all for your faithfulness in it. Tonight would have been our annual business meeting, as you had seen that in the bulletin, but with pastor's absence, we're going to move that to the following week. And so next Sunday night will be our annual business meeting, and we'll be able to rejoice together in all the goodness that God has shown to us over this past year and the faithfulness that, um, that you guys have demonstrated as well, not only financially but in ministry and uh, in uh, seeking to impact not only our community but the folks that come here each and every week and uh, we are grateful for all of those things. Um, after the offering here, uh, Pastor Brandenburg will just come up and we just want to again publicly thank him for being, as I texted him this morning, said thank you for being available and thank you for being flexible, but uh, especially thank you for um, being a, a one who desires to preach the word. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing what God has to say through his servant this morning and this evening. And I know it will be a blessing to our hearts. Uh, Brother, would you lead us in prayer, David? Lord, we ask you today to...
Amen. Haven't you enjoyed the music this morning? It's been good. Amen. Well, uh, take your Bibles. You're going to want to uh, put a couple markers in a couple places. If you'll uh, put a marker in Hebrews chapter 10. I know the Sunday school class was expecting Hebrews 11 because I've thought in there for many weeks on that. But Hebrews 10, put another marker in the book of Job, Job chapter 1. So you've got a marker in Hebrews 10, a marker in Job chapter 1, and then, a mar- and then we'll turn to Exodus chapter 24. I always enjoy the opportunity to preach. That's, that is my calling. It's what I do. And uh, normally for the last year and a half, I've been traveling and preaching, and lately the, me- the meetings are very, very low in number. And uh, so I always look forward for an opportunity to preach. Uh, when I was an assistant pastor years ago, uh, you know, the pastor would call me, like on a Saturday night, and say, Brother Doug, pray for me, I'm not feeling well. well. That's hard for an assistant pastor who doesn't get to preach much to know how to pray. I want him to get better, but if he doesn't get better, I get to preach. So I pray he gets better at like at 8 o'clock Sunday night, you know. And uh, was Friday I was sitting at the house and I get a phone call from pastor. He said, uh, Brother Brandenburg, I said, yes sir, he said, I need a favor. Now, you know what that means. So yes, okay, there's something going on. And the way he said it, it's like, okay, this is not something I was expecting. Like, sure, preach whatever it is, you know. And uh, he said, well, and then he told me the story and, uh, and said, could you preach Sunday? I said, sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I love, I, I'd rather preach than eat. And I like eating, amen. And, uh, but I was thinking as I was sitting there, I preached at the same camp where he's at, not the same camp week. I preached there two years ago there in, in, uh, in Canada. I got a call on a Friday, the preacher who was supposed to be there had a death in the family and couldn't come and needed me to come on Monday to start their youth camp. And uh, I was preaching another meeting and, uh, and drove home and preached at our church on Sunday, then Monday drove out to the camp. So I don't know if that's a pattern for those guys, but anyway, all right, he said, why are you taking so long? I was letting you find the book of Job, all right, all right, all right. Exodus chapter 24, we'll begin in verse number 1. There's an amazing passage of Scripture here. And this is the Lord speaking to Moses. And and he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord thou and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the seventy elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said will we do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all of these words. Here, we'll stop our reading there, uh, but keep your marker there in in Exodus 24. We'll, We'll come right back to that. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us this morning. Father, we are so thankful. We have an opportunity to be in church this morning, and we've our hearts have been encouraged and blessed by the music and the specials. Thank you for the good hymns we've been able to sing, and as our hearts have been turned toward you. I pray you'd help us now as we gather around your word. And this was a service that you orchestrated, you planned, and you knew who would be here. You knew who the speaker would be, and you knew which message would be preached. And we're thankful for that. I pray you would meet with us in an unusual way. I pray, dear God, that this would not just be a, a sermon, but literally a message to each of us from heaven. And may we not leave here the way we were when we came. I pray if there's one that does not know Jesus as their Savior, their sins have not yet been forgiven. May, be, may this be the morning when they come to know him. I pray you'd speak to every heart. I pray you'd direct me as I speak. Help me to say only that which you once said. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Here in Exodus chapter number 24, we find the, that Moses is on top of the mountain there, and, and he's getting from God all these instructions. He received the law from God. As he's up on the mountain and the people are down in the valley and, and, and he receives not only the law of God, but at the same time he, he receives the plans for the tabernacle. What an amazing picture of the grace of God. Because the law pictures the guilt of man's sin, but the tabernacle pictures the, 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 the vastness of the grace of God. The law condemns us. But it's the tabernacle that showed us and provided us a way to be redeemed. The redeeming law was, uh, uh, the condemning law was pronounced and the remedy for sin was provided at the same time. What an amazing God. The law is man's condemnation for sin, but the tabernacle is God's remedy for sin. The law showed the awfulness of sin, but the tabernacle showed the awesomeness. Of God's grace. Yes, that really is a word. I looked it up to make sure it worked. It is a real word. Uh, in our family, we have this little rule, you know, if you have a college degree, you get to make up rules. You know, if you have an advanced degree, you get to make up definitions. And if you have a degree in education, and I do, uh, then you get to not only make up words and definitions, but spelling and usage. So and that's, that's just the way we do it in our house. Amen. But God gave first the law, which speaks of God's justice and holiness. And we, may never, we must never forget, God is holy and he hates sin. But the tabernacle, it speaks of his mercy and pardon and forgiveness and atonement and redemption and salvation. Moses, he reads the book of the law. You saw it there. It says he read to the people there. Look again at, at uh, verse, let me get back to it, verse number, um, verse 3. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And, uh, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. Uh, people talk to me, say, man, Brother Brendan, you use a lot of pre- uh, scripture when you preach. Can you imagine being there when he read the entire law? You thought I used a lot of verses, but he read them all, amen. And when he read that, the people, as you see in verse 3, they responded, all the words which the Lord hath said, will we do? Uh, The people said, we will do, and they were counting, I believe, on what they could do to merit the grace and mercy of God. What was Moses' response? Look back at verse number 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings unto the Lord. So he reads the law. They said, everything God said, we will do. His response, he built an altar, slayed some animals, and had offerings, had sacrifices. And he reads the people again, the book of the law, verse 7. He took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. Again, the people said, we will do. That is exactly the way human nature is. We want to do something to play a part in our salvation. We want to be the one that earns it. We want to be the one that does what it takes to get it. And look at Moses' response in verse number 8. This is where we'll find not only the text, but also the title of the message. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Man said, We will do. God said, Behold the blood. Man says, we will do these works. And God says, your work will not do. It requires the blood of a perfect sacrifice for there to be an atonement for sin. You see, there's nothing you and I can do to redeem ourselves. There's not one act we can do that will cause our sins to be forgiven. There's not one bit of money we can pay. There's not one church service we can attend that will earn our way to heaven. No, we cannot do because it has already been done. On Calvary, when God sent His Son to shed His blood for our sin. Hebrews 9.22 says, Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Jesus did not come to earth to give us a good story. He didn't come just to be, in fact, He was not a martyr. He came to be the sacrifice for sin. He was offered to God as the sacrifice. 
All those Old Testament sacrifices, they're just a shadow, a brief glimpse of what God was going to do at Calvary. Uh, how many of you have a checking account? Most of us don't use those anymore. We use little cards. You know what a check is? It's a worthless piece of paper. My dad always asks, can I write you a rubber check? <laughs> and he has one. That's nuts. You've seen him. But uh, a, a check is nothing more than a promise. You write a check to someone, you hand it to them. That piece of paper is worth nothing. It's just a promise that in a bank, there is the money that you say you want to give to them. And if they go to the bank, the bank will give them the money. It's a promise. You know what the Old Testament sacrifices were? They were just a check that was written. They weren't the payment. When Jesus came and died on Calvary's cross and shed his blood and was buried and he rose again, Jesus cashed the check. That's what the Old Testament sacrifices were. You see, it is the blood of Christ that is the basis for our redemption and our atonement. Man said, we will do. God said, behold the blood. I believe there's three different distinct times and in three situations where Jesus says, Behold the blood. First of all, I think we see it here in our text that Jesus says, Behold the blood in response to the sinner's works. You see, all men are, we're just like the children of Israel. We think we can earn our way. Uh, my dad was born during the Depression, and he's got that, that uh, attitude that many of, of you have that I'll, I'll earn my own way. Dad doesn't like anything given to him, he wants to do it himself. Anybody know somebody like that? Just, I don't need any help, I can handle it. And, and, and that's just the way that generation was, and thank God for that, amen? But in our nature, that's the way we are. But God says, what you will do, will not do. Uh, the, the people of Israel said, we will do, and God said, behold, the blood. Man's nature wants to do something to merit our salvation. It's interesting, in, in Mark 10, when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and he said, sir, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, you know, talks to him about keeping the law. And he says, well, I've done that from my youth up. And then he turns to that rich young ruler and says, well, sell what you have and give to the poor. Now, that's not what gives you salvation. Jesus was making a point. And the man didn't even respond to Jesus. He walked away grieving. Like he wanted to earn his eternal life. And Jesus was showing, you've got a sin of covetousness. So Jesus was dealing with his sin. He wasn't saying, you sell everything you have, get to the poor, you get to go to heaven. No, he was proving to that man, there's nothing you can do to buy it. I love what Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. In Ephesians 2, 8 9, we all know these verses. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. If you and I could get to heaven by what we do, we'd be bragging about it. You say, well, how do you know that? Because we brag now. We get to heaven, there'll be nothing to brag about. I love the story told about um, uh, uh, the, the writer of, of uh, uh, Amazing Grace, uh, John Newton. When he, uh, he was saved out of a wicked life uh, of being a slave trader. He grew up as a, as a captain of a slave ship. He'd been raised in church and he had, he had lived his whole, whole life, though, once he grew up, he got away from God, away from what his parents had taught him in the scriptures, and lived a very wicked life. One day he was on a slave ship, and it was about to, to go down. And uh, the, the storm had come, and, and they were about to sink, and he was about to lose his life. And he remembered his mother telling him about the grace of God, and that he would save us if we'd call out to him. And, on that slave ship, John Newton called out to Christ and he got saved and later wrote that great song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. Once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Later on in life, he said, when we get to heaven, there'll be three wonders there. He, first, he said, first of all, when I get to heaven, there will be people there that I did not expect to see. We all know that. There'll be people saved that we didn't think they were saved. Number two, he said, the second wonder is there will not be people there that I did expect to see. He said, but the greatest wonder is that I will be there. Oh, what a great God we have. Aren't you glad that salvation is not based upon what you can do? Man says, we will do. But Jesus says, behold the blood. Moses told the people, your works will not do. It takes the blood of a sacrifice. You see, the law could not save. 
In Romans 8 verse 3, the Bible says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemning sin in the flesh. If we could get to heaven by what we do, why did Jesus have to die? Why did he have to shed his blood? Now, he was the only sacrifice. We see that illustrated in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and they knew that they had sinned. And what was the first thing they did? They sewed fig leaves together to make them aprons. They tried to cover up their own nakedness, the, 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 the evidence of their sin. And what did God do? He slayed an animal and covered them with coats of skin, showing us it's not what we can do. There has to be a death on our behalf for us to have a covering. Cain and Abel, they both brought their offering. Both were sincere. Uh, Abel brought the firstling of his flock. He, he brought a lamb and slayed it. And God accepted that. Cain brought the first fruits of his garden. He brought the best that he had. But it was the wrong sacrifice. God told him, you, you've got the wrong sacrifice. And, and in fact, that's why he got mad and ended up killing his brother. Why? Because he wanted to do something to earn his salvation. Galatians 2 and verse 16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed on Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Man says, we will do. God says, behold the blood. I love 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The blood of Christ was precious because it was costly. You realize it cost God everything to save you? That's why the blood is precious. It's precious because it's highly esteemed. It's honored. Jesus was virgin born. His blood did not have the taint of sin that every human has had since Adam. Because he was perfect. The sinless son of God. The children of Israel wanted to do something to be forgiven of their sin. But God said in response to them saying, we will do. Jesus, uh, the the. the the Word of God says that God said, Behold the blood. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. Uh, you got a marker there in Hebrews. I told you to go to Hebrews 10. We'll get there in a minute. Go to Hebrews 9. Just back a chapter. Hebrews 9. We'll come back to, uh, I think we'll come back to Exodus in a minute. But Hebrews 9. And look what it says in verse number 11. Hebrews 9, 11, But Christ becoming a high priest of good things to come by a greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified through the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What's he saying? Your works will not do. It took Jesus to die on a cross and be sacrificed for our sin. But the blood didn't just flow down and go into the earth. The Bible tells us Jesus took that blood and put it on the altar in heaven. The tabernacle here on earth was a picture of what God was going to do. Jesus came in. Can you imagine that day in heaven when Jesus came in with nail prints in his hands and the place in his side, but he came with the blood from, from the sacrifice on Calvary and he came into the Holy of Holies in heaven and came to the, to the altar in heaven and he put his own blood there. And praise God, it's still there. Amen. It's the sacrifice for our sins. And I knew it was going to knock something over. For who, Gina, I'm sorry. Now, if I don't step on it, I'm going to pick that up because I will walk over here and I will step on that. And then she'll be mad at me. We can't have that. Amen. Your works will not do. I love that song. My, this is a song every time my dad goes to a church to speak, he'll pull out a hymnal. He did it here. And he turned over to see if this song was in there. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fountain, no nothing. 
but the blood of Jesus. You know, back in Exodus chapter 12, when the children of Israel were about to leave Egypt, what did God do? God had them slay a lamb and take the blood and put on the doorposts and the lintel. And God said, the death angel will come. And when he sees the blood on the doorpost, he'll pass over that house. And any house that doesn't have the blood on the doorpost and lintel, the firstborn will die. We know from reading in the book of Exodus that that's exactly what happened and that there wasn't a single house of the Egyptians where the firstborn did not die. Moaning and wailing all over the nation, but it, it, where the Israelites were because of the blood, God passed over them. That's where we get our great song, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. There are some that say, well, it's only the death of Christ that was important. Oh, no. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Jesus had to suffer. He had to die. He had to shed his blood. Why? Because it needed to be the sacrifice for our sins. Charles Spurgeon said there are some preachers who cannot or do not preach about the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, I have one thing to tell you about them. Never go to hear them. Never listen to them. Amen, I say to that. Amen. Uh, God did not say to the children of Israel there in Exodus 12, when I see the body of the Lamb. No, He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Man says we will do God says, behold the blood. Tis done, tis done. The great transaction's done. In John, in John chapter number 19, in verse number 30, Jesus, while hanging on Calvary's cross, cried out in, in our King James Bible, it uses this, this language, it is finished. Those three words in the Greek language are one word, the word tetelestai. It's an interesting word. It's used in several different ways. It's a word used by a, a shepherd when he was taking care of the lambs and, and when when a brand new lamb was born, he would examine that lamb, and if it was a perfect birth, he would use the same word, tetelestai, to describe this perfect birth. It was a word used by the priests on the, when the people would bring their sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. He would examine the lamb, and, and, and of course, according to Levitical law, when you brought a lamb for a sacrifice, it had to be perfect. It couldn't be lame, it couldn't be blind. You couldn't bring the lamb you couldn't sell as an offering. God said, you bring your best. And so that priest would take that lamb and he would examine it to see, is this a lamb that's fit for sacrifice? And if it was a perfect little lamb, not a, not a single spot on it, it was not lame, it wasn't deaf, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't mute, it was a perfect little lamb, he would use a word to describe that sacrifice. He would say, tetelestai, it's perfect. The musicians, we've had great music today, the musicians would use this. Well, they would compose some music. And they would write this, this portion of music and if every note harmonized, I mean, it was just beautiful. He would use a word to describe that, to tell us time, meaning it harmonized perfectly. It was a word used by the artists when they would paint a portrait, paint a painting. And if, if, if the painting was perfect when he was done, I mean, if everything was in perspective and, and all the proportions were right and the colors were perfect, he would use a word to describe that perfect painting. He would use the word to tell us time. It was a soldier's word. And soldiers would go out to battle. They didn't have radios like we do. And, and they would go and, and they would leave a runner at the edge of the battle. And, and that runner would come back to the town or the place where the army had come from to bring word of the battle. And he would describe it. If the soldier came back and if it was an overwhelming victory, one from which the enemy could never rise again, he would use the word Tetelestai, meaning it's perfect. It's a battle that's been won and the enemy will never rise up again. It's a word used when people would go to debtor's prison. Can you imagine if we had one of those in America today? If you went to jail because you didn't pay your bills, we'd have to cordon off the state of Texas and put them all there, amen. But if you were in prison and you couldn't pay your bill and you were there and somebody came along and paid your debt, they would take a little stone and they would write on the stone to tell us die, meaning it's paid in full. And that prisoner could walk out of that prison and the guard tried to stop him. He would just hold up the stone that would have the word to tell us die, meaning it's paid in full. In John chapter 19 and verse number 30, when Jesus was hanging on Calvary's cross and he cried out, it is finished. He was saying it's a perfect sacrifice. It harmonizes with God's holiness. It means that the victory has been won. The devil can never rise up from this victory and the debt has been paid in full. Why? Because of the blood of Christ. 
Man says Mount Sinai. God says Mount Calvary. Man says law. God says grace. Man says my righteousness. And God says no, my righteousness. Oh, I love that song. Would you be free from your, the power? Uh, would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. I love that song. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Probably my favorite song about Calvary would be there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Jesus says, behold the blood in response to to our work to try to get to heaven on our own. And I'm going to dare say that most of us in this room, we already understand that. We've come to the point in our life where we understood we're a sinner and that the price for sin is death. And there's no way to go to heaven without the payment for sin, which was Jesus Christ. But if you're in this room this morning, and it's not the end of the message, but if you're in this room this morning, you've not yet, not yet trusted Jesus as your Savior, can I tell you there's nothing you can do to earn it. There's no way to get your salvation by your own merit. You must come to the Lord Jesus and trust what he did on Calvary. When he died, was buried, and rose again to pay your sin debt. And if you'll just trust him, the Bible says you'll have redemption. But you're there in Hebrews chapter 9. Look over at Hebrews chapter 10. Jesus says, behold the blood in response to the sinner's works. But that's not the only time. Look at verse number 19 of Hebrews 10. It's the first time I've ever come to a pulpit where there's water and a cup of coffee. <laughs> Is that church with John? I drink sissy coffee. Uh, when I, I don't get a Starbucks unless somebody gives me a gift card. When I go there, I get a white chocolate mocha, add two pumps of caramel, whipped cream, and caramel drizzle on top. It's a diabetic coma in a cup. But if you're going to die, you might as well die happy. Amen? So, but I'm going to leave that cup alone because I don't know what's in there. Hebrews 10, verse number 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness, holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. Did you notice what it says here? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ. What's he saying? He was saying, he's talking about our prayer life. In the Old Testament, nobody could go into the Holy of Holies except the high priest and only on the Day of Atonement. That's one of those jobs I wouldn't want. All right, because the high priest went in there and he offered the sacrifice for the whole nation. If, the, if God didn't accept the sacrifice, he killed the high priest. Yeah, I'll let Brother John do that one. I just, you know, Brother Wagle, he can handle that. I'll just stay out here and pray for him, amen. But the tabernacle was the only place where God's Shekinah glory would come from heaven and meet with man. It happened later in the temple on the day of the dedication in Solomon's day that God so filled the temple, the Bible says the priests could not do their work. Oh man, I pray for that in our church services, amen. But the only place that you and I can meet God today is through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're there in Hebrews 10, look back at chapter 9 and verse number 24. We read this a moment ago. Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which, is, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So where's Jesus today? He's in heaven pleading our case. He's our go-between, our lawyer, if you will. The priest in the tabernacle would offer up incense continually. It says in Exodus 29, verse 20, thou shalt... Killed the ram and take of his blood and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, upon the, the, the right ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of their right hand, and upon the great toe of their right foot, and sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. It says in chapter 30, verse 10, And Aaron sh shall make a, an atonement upon the horns of it once a year, with the blood of the sin offering of the atonements once a year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. Here we see God is saying the only way to approach me is through the blood. The priest had to put it on his right ear as a symbol. You'll never hear from God till you come by the blood. 
They put it on the thumb of their right hand. Most people are right-handed and work with their right hand. You can't work for God unless you come by the blood. On his right foot, on the toe of his right foot, uh, they put the blood. Why, you can't go for God unless you've come by the blood. And then on the altar, you can't even come to the altar unless the blood has been there. You understand what God is saying right here. He's saying in chapter 10 and verse number 19 that we have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies to talk with our God. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. If you'll turn back there. I love hearing those pages of Scripture turn. It's my favorite sound. Hebrews 7, verse 25, uh, 25, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, then for the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Jesus right now is in heaven, As I said a moment ago, acting as our lawyer, our go-between, interceding for us. Why? So we may enter into the throne room of God and bring our petitions. Having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. Back during the, the war between the states, one day President Lincoln was in his office. There was a guard outside. He was having a meeting with some of his generals. The little nine or ten year old boy walked down the hallway and came to the office door where the president was. He nodded at the, at the guard and walked in without being announced. You don't do that. But he did. He walked right into the meeting and came right to the president and hopped up on his lap and said, Hi, Dad. Can you imagine that meeting? Man. Why could he do that? Because he was a son. You understand what the Bible is telling us here in, here in Hebrews? that we can come boldly into the throne of grace. Why? We're a son. We've been bought with a price. Our sin has been forgiven. When God sees you and I that we've been saved, He no longer sees our sin. He only sees the righteousness of Christ. I love the poem, Before the court of law I stood in fear with bated breath. Truth said, here I must die. The wages of sin is death. Then righteousness looked down on me and said, send him away. For I hate all wrong and cannot look upon his sin this day. Then one came forth and spoke for me and said, before this case begins, I, his barrister, wish to see some evidence of sins. There was confusion then in the court and many looked around. My lawyer smiled for well he knew that my sins could not be found. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, buried deep were they. It involved a hill and a cross and the price God's son would pay. God knew when Christ died and arose that sin's hold on man would cease. And thus did mercy meet with truth and righteousness kiss peace. You understand, you and I, because of the blood of Christ, we have an opportunity anytime we want to, to walk into the very throne room of God and bring our petitions. And he hears us. Let me ask you a question. When we realize how much it costs God to give us that opportunity. I and mean, we understand it took the blood of Christ to save us. That means we'll go to heaven one day and we'll have eternal life and we'll live with God forever. Won't that be wonderful? But that same blood provides an opportunity to come before His face today in prayer. The question then is, when's the last time you exercised that right? Jesus shed his blood on Calvary that you might have an opportunity to speak to God without going to an earthly mediator. But most of us, we cheapen the sacrifice of Christ because we never give thought to coming into his presence. The same blood that purchased your redemption provided an opportunity to speak to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, as a believer this morning, would you look at your prayer life? Would you take some time to think, when was the last time I came into the the throne room of God boldly? Most of us, we go to prayer, the first thing we have to pray is, God, please forgive me for not praying. But because of the blood of Christ, we have the opportunity to come anytime we want boldly into his throne. Why? That we might find grace to help in time of need. Amen? What a wonderful thing. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now 
Christ Jesus, uh, ye who some, now in Christ Jesus, some of you were, were sometimes far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Calls God everything to redeem you. And he gave you an opportunity because of that redemption to come into the throne room. It is absolutely enough, there's absolutely nothing God can do for the sinner unless he comes by the blood. I want you to look at one last place. Uh, yeah, I see what time it is. We'll be out of here soon. That's a relative statement. Somebody asked a preacher, he said, I noticed at the end of every sermon you say, I hasten. What does that mean? He said nothing. All right. <laughs> Job chapter 1. Job 1. Look at verse number 6. Job's one of those books we hear about, but most of us don't read it very often. Job 1. Verse number 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, you picture this. We're talking about heaven, and, and, and those that are saved, they're coming by, and, and then in the middle of that setting where those that love God are there honoring Him, in walks Satan, the deceiver, Lucifer. He comes in. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro through in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, and one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Hast thou, and thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance and has increased in thine hand. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto to Satan, Behold, all that um, he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put forth not thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. You understand what's going on here? Satan comes into the presence of God and God asks him, where you been? He said, walking around the earth. And God says, did you see Job? You understand what God's doing? He's bragging on Job. Satan would not have messed with Job had God not brought him up. And that's why, you know, I, I don't want God to brag about me. I want him to brag about Brother Duke. Let Satan mess with him. Leave me alone. But God said, did you see Job? And Satan says, well, the only reason he serves you is because you bless him. He's rich. He's healthy. You take that away, he'll curse you. And we know the story of Job. What happened? God let Satan do that to him and took everything he had. Took his ten children, all of his, all of his donkeys, all of his cattle. I mean, his ten children were killed. All of that happened. And he still didn't curse God. His wife said, curse God and die. He said, the Lord give it, the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now here's my point. Here's a man, the Bible says that there's none like him in all the earth. That means he was the example of what a follower of God was to be. And Satan started accusing him. And said, oh, no, 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 you don't understand God. The, the reason Job does that is because you bless him. You understand that same Satan makes accusations against you and I. The book of Revelation tells us that. It tells us in Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 9. And the great dragon was cast out and the old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death. Satan accuses us before God and says, look what they did. And Jesus just responds, behold the blood. You see, when God sees me and he sees you, if you've been redeemed, he doesn't see someone who was a sinner who got forgiveness. No, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For ye have made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What that verse is telling us is that when you and I got saved, God takes our sin record and he puts it judicially on Jesus. That's why he died. He suffered our sin. He died for us. And he takes Jesus' righteousness and puts it on our account. So when God looks at a saved person, all he sees is the righteousness of Christ. Not even a hint of sin. 
Hallelujah. It doesn't mean we're sinless. It means he was. And it's his record that gets us into heaven. Amen. So when Satan comes to God and says, look at that wicked sinner. You're letting him preach this morning, but he's just a wicked sinner. And God looks and says, all I see is blood. Behold the blood in response to Satan's accusation. During World War II, there was a, uh, of course, in, in Europe, the, the, the great battle between uh, the Allied forces and, and the Axis forces against Germany. And the Nazi Germany was just destroying community after community. There came a point that they were coming to this one town, it was towards the end of the war, and, and they were just going through one village to the next, one city to the next, just literally annihilating everyone. They came to this little town where, where missionary Willie Tubner lived. He was a little boy at the time. They came and his dad gathered the, the family together and said, listen, the, the guards are coming. He said, and they're killing everybody in town. And he said, we've got to hide from them. And the way that the guards would, or the way the soldiers would mark a house that they had killed everybody in it, they would take the blood of the last victim and put it on the door. So they came to uh, Mr. Tubner. He got his family together and said, listen, we, we've, got to, we've, we've got to hide. So he took his children and he put his, the kids in their room. He put it, the wife in the kitchen next to the sink. And he had taken the family's pet lamb that they had and taken it down into the basement and killed it. And took the blood and caught it in a bowl and came and put blood all over his daughter and all over his son. And then went to his wife and covered the blood on her. And then he put blood on himself and he washed out the bowl and he laid down in the living room with blood all over him. Thinking maybe if they'll come and they see the blood, they'll think we're dead. It's a true story. You could hear the boots of the soldiers as they came down the street. You could hear the rifles. You could hear them shooting. You could hear people screaming. And Mr. Tubner remembered, there was something I didn't do. They would take that blood and put it on the door. He'd forgotten to do that. He had used all the blood. He ran back down into the basement, and by the way, he, he, he cut the heart out of that little lamb. He ran back upstairs. He opened the front door of his house and threw the, the, the heart against the door. It exploded, and blood covered the door. He closed the door. No sooner had he laid down and was breathing, he knew they could hear him. He could hear the soldiers coming up the steps to their house. And they started to open the door. And another soldier cried out, said, wait a minute, stop, can't you see? Look at the blood on the door. This house has already been hit. And they closed the door and went on down the street. And the Tubner family was saved. Brother Willie later became a missionary. You understand, that's what happened when Satan comes to accuse you and I as believers. God says, wait a minute, this house has already been hit. Maybe this morning you're, you're a Christian, but maybe your life hasn't gone the way you expect it to. Maybe you're struggling in some areas and Satan is bombarding your memory and he's saying, this is what you used to be and how could God bless you? I'm here to tell you this morning, because of the blood of Christ, God looks at you and he looks at Satan and says, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no sin on that record. Behold the blood. But this morning, I don't know what your need is. I don't know if you're lost and on your way to hell. You've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. But can I tell you, there's a loving God in heaven that sent His Son to die on Calvary to pay your sin debt. And if you'll just come to Him, and trust Him, the Bible says He'll wash your sin away and give you everlasting life. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. You say, what's that? We're going to stand, some music's going to play, and we're going to give you an opportunity to come forward. We'll have somebody take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. You can have your sins forgiven this morning. Maybe you're a believer this morning, and your relationship with God's not what it ought to be. It's been a while since you spent any time with Him in prayer. This would be a good morning to come to an altar and get that right. Say, God, because of what it cost you to allow me into your presence, you're going to find me there often. Or maybe this morning you're a believer that's discouraged and Satan's been bothering you. It'd be a good time to come to the altar and just thank God for the victory that is in Jesus Christ. And come this morning and renew that relationship with Him and get your confidence back as a believer. Behold the blood.
Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Who would say this morning, Brother Brandenburg, I, I know for sure that I'm going to go to heaven. I know my sins are forgiven. I have trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you lift your hand? So that's me. I know I'm saved. That a wonderful thing. Thank you. You may put your hands down with nobody looking around. Who would say this morning, Brother Brandenburg, I, I do not know for sure that I'm going to go to heaven. I don't know that my sins are forgiven, but I'd like to know that. Would you pray for me? Would you lift your hand and keep it up for just a moment so I can see it? Say, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm going to go to heaven, but I'd like to know that. Would you raise your hand? All right, in just a moment when we stand, if you'd like to know that, just slip out of your seat, come to the front, get my attention. We'll have somebody help you from the scriptures with that. Who would say this morning, Brother Vanderberg, my, my prayer life is not what it ought to be. This morning, God spoke to me about that. Pray for me. That's my need. Would you lift your hands? That's me. Yes, thank you. Who would say this morning, honestly, preacher, there's, there's some things going on in my life where Satan's been bothering me about my past. And I realized this morning it's under the blood. And I'm not going to let Satan do that to me anymore. I need God's help to get victory over that. Preacher, pray for me. I'm discouraged and Satan's attacking me and I need his help. Would you pray for me? Would you lift your hands? That's me this morning. Thank you. Let's all stand together while I pray. Father, I pray you'd help us now during this time of invitation. May we not just stay in our pew if you spoke to our heart, but may you draw us to an altar. If there's one that's not saved, would you draw them quickly to the altar? Help us in this area of our prayer life, in our area of, of our confidence in you. Would you help us to claim the victory that is in Jesus Christ? For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.